Very happy to be welcoming Lady Warren today as our presenter. Lady is a PhD student in Hispanic linguistics in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies here at the University of Minnesota. And she is also the Carla Fellow this year. So we um, have one to two Carla Fellows every year who get support to travel to an academic conference to present their work. And then we also ask them to share their work here in this Carla That's environment. So, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Lady. Just before I do that, um, we'll leave the chat open. Um, Lady's gonna be asking you to do a little bit of participation in the chat, and then we'll use the chat for your questions. So any questions that you wanna ask at the end of the presentation, please put them in the chat and I'll facilitate that Q&A. The title of Lady's talk is Adapting Scenarios as a Mechanism for Measuring L2 Fluency. Take it away, Lady. Thank you, Kay, for that introduction, and thanks everybody for attending my presentation. Um, as Kate mentioned, my name is Lady Warren, and I am a PhD student in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies. And my presentation today is entitled Adopting a Scenarios as a Mechanism for Measuring Alto Fluency. So um, to start, I give you a brief idea about how my presentation is organized. So this way, I will start talking about concepts such as fluency and its measures. Um, exams be used to measure fluency, the gaps we can find between um, the theory and the current exams um, that there are right now. And as this is a theoretical presentation mainly, I will present my proposal of a different oral exam format, and I will end with a discussion with, which is more related with the reasons of choosing this method to evaluate. So, therefore, I would like to ask you, what words do you associate with fluency? Please write in the chat the words that come to your mind with this term, fluence. Okay, integration patterns, elaboration, ease of communication, yes, yeah. Compare, that's true. Successfully navigating linguistic ambiguity, negotiation of meaning, exactly. Yep, so um, communication, accuracy. Yep. So all these terms are related with uh, fluency, and I'm sure I'm gonna make mention of these words at some point during the presentation. So, um, uh, those sound so interesting and um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about this work and I'm going to I'm going to start saying that fluency have three main approaches in language acquisition first cognitive fluency which is related with the working memory and this type of mental processes um, however uh, this is not the main point of the presentation I just mentioned it but I won't focus on this one so then we have the utterance fluency um, which is known as the narrow perspective. And the final approach is the perceived fluency, uh, which is known as the broad perspective. I'm gonna talk more about these two last perspectives in the next slides. So uh, the concept of utterance fluency uh, encompasses various dimensions, including speed, smoothness, and effortless of speech as defined by Chambers and Lennon. Additionally, uh, Skehan highlights elements such as breakdown, uh, repair, including reformulation, uh, repetition, and false starts, and speed as well. This narrow perspective of fluency emphasizes these features, speed, breakdown, and repair as indicator of an individual's oral performance, making fluency a measurable skill based on characteristics observed during the speech. So to go in deeper with these ones, uh, I'm gonna start with the speech. So there are various methods to measure each uh, feature um, and those are defined by the researcher. So these are some examples are uh, related with the speech. We have speech rate, which is calculated uh, with the number of syllables divided by the total time of a speech. We have articulation rate that is similar to the speech rate, but this one excludes pauses of 0 0.25 seconds and above. 
and phonation run, which uh, measures the duration of phonation between two pauses. In summary, these measures take into account factors such as time, pauses, and speaking rhythm um, to assess the speed of speech performance. Moving on the breakdown feature, it involves measures such as uh, pause duration, which represents the average length of silent pauses, the number of field pauses per 100 words, and pause frequency, uh, which is typically measured uh, in seconds. While these measures still incorporate factors like the previous one, pauses, speaking rhythm, and time, uh, the focus shifts more towards the characteristics of pauses rather than the speaking portion itself, like the previous uh, feature that is speed. Uh, finally, we have the repair feature, um, which involves assessing interruptions in a speech and the disfluency rate, which encompasses false starts, repetitions, reformulations, and self-corrections. This means that various types of repairs are measured based on their impact of process, speaking rhythm, and time. And this way, we can see like a pattern with these three previous um, features uh, used to define how measure, how fluency is measured under the narrow perspective. So this is like going more deep detail with the speech production. Now transitioning to the perceived fluency, which is the broad one, uh, this is characterized as the overall proficiency in a language and the judgment form about speakers based on impressions derived from their speech samples. Unlike the narrow perspective where the focus is on measurable variables within a speech, in this broader perspective, oral proficiency is assessed through perception. So this is like the main um, quality of this one that is different from the narrow one. So to facilitate this assessment, Evaluators rely on rubrics and guidelines that provide criteria for assigning rates or scores. So this is like the way to measure, uh, to make it more accountable, this kind of um, broad perspective. So an example of such rubrics and guidelines, uh, we have this one provided by John and Chen, who develop a rating criteria to be measured on a three-point scale. Uh, this one includes several aspects of oral proficiency ass assessment, such as content delivery, focusing on the smoothness and fluidity of turn initiations and transitions, language use, which evaluates the utilization of pragmatic tools, uh, such as structures and models to convey um, indirectness, sensitivity to the situation um, that is assessing the adaptation of accounts and explanations to suit the Intend the recipient engagement with the interaction, measuring the ability to track previous turns and respond appropriately in real time, and organization of the turns, um, uh, which uh, means evaluating the completeness of adjacency pairs and the appropriateness of pauses. So, I think that at this point, comparing the narrow one and the broad one, uh, we have like taking into account the definitions you said about or the words related with fluency that you mentioned at the beginning of the chat. So in summary, Juna Chen proposed to evaluate terms and interaction, pragmatic linguistic knowledge, speed and process, and all of these are based on perception and in the suggestion they do is uh, measured in a three point scale base, but it could be different depending on the researcher uh, and depending on the rubric they have, but this is just like one example. So in conclusion, it is essential to highlight that as evidence in the previous um, studies and mentioned in the previous slides, the narrow perspective of fluency often attributes a higher level of oral competence to individuals who exhibit fewer poses, maintain an appropriate speaking rhythm, which may not necessarily mean be extremely fast and speak for longer durations with correlates with fewer pauses overall. On the other hand, the broad perspective consider important to maintain a good level of terms and interaction, a high awareness of programmatic linguistic knowledge, a faster speed of speaking, 
which it does not mean extremely fast as before, but with less uh, pauses. So despite the differences in measures due to their perspective perspectives, um, narrow and broad, there is a certain level of correlation between, between these two viewpoints because it's like mainly the same features they want to uh, see and measure somehow. So then after having um, like a better picture of what yeah. fluency means, uh, of what fluency means, uh, the question um, that arises from this is, how is fluency evaluated? So for this, um, for this purpose, uh, we can see different types of exams used to measure the oral proficiency. So it is evident the evolution of the exams format uh, because we move on from phonetic transcription to a conversation with the evaluator. Uh, the graphic is organized uh, trying to show the least to the most conversational task. Then it does not necessarily match with dates because as you can see, the years are different and are not like in a progressive way. It's more based on the nature of the task. Then the most recent exams are those that are used, um, such as the oral interview, as in the case of the first certificate in English, the oral proficiency interview known as OPI, and, and in the case of Spanish, the Diploma de Español como Lengua Extranjera known as DELE. So these are just some exams to cite, um, good examples of this type of task uh, to measure the, the fluency or the oral performance of, of a person. So additionally to the previous task, we have um, other exams created for research purposes, and these have different formats and have been used in a different way. For example, there is the photo description task where the examinees receive a picture and they need to describe it to evaluators. Other formats include reading a lower text uh, and they have the mix, so the mix with this and the photo description that is the same activity before. And others include um, watching a video and then um, the ones who are taking the exam need to recount it to the examiner in the target language. So these practices are commonly used to assess the oral proficiency in research settings. And this data is used to find out the fluency in a narrow or a broad perspective. So after getting this data, uh, researchers used to measure or the narrow perspective based on the measures uh, mentioned before, or the perspective uh, through a perception uh, surveys or questionnaires. However, in accordance with Bachmann and Palmer, uh, language testing instruments should possess certain qualities that prompt a uh, reconsideration of current formats used to evaluate oral proficiency. So these qualities um, include authenticity, which refers to how closely the test task mirrors real world tasks, interactiveness, which involves the interaction between the test taker, their uh, language ability, topic knowledge, emotional context, and the task itself, and practicality, which pertains to whether the test specifications can be feasible, met with available resources. So in summary, a language testing instrument should feature tasks that replicate real world scenarios, encourage interaction, and can be administered with ease. Therefore, like analyzing the current formats, uh, we can observe that the photo description task lacks out authenticity and is not it does not align with typical communication patterns and fails to promote interaction because that is not exactly the way we used to communicate. So it functions more as a presentational task. However, it can be easily practiced because it is easy for the test taker to describe a picture and for the evaluator to understand what the examining means because the picture is known in advance. Regarding the video recounting, uh, while it may partially mirror real world scenarios where information needs to be communicated, it still lacks typical communication dynamics and interaction. But at the previous, ta previous task, it can be administered with easiness. Uh, about the reading task combined with photo description, it follows a similar pattern that the first uh, task, we need to practice but lacking authenticity and interactiveness. And finally, oral interviews, on the contrary, better meet the criteria for authenticity and interaction, uh, yet they may not fully fulfill these qualities as evaluators often will need interaction um, 
resulting in an unavoidable compare um, to natural conversation dynamics. Uh, but this is like a widely used uh, proficiency task uh, in the exams. Um, as you know, um, evaluators following this type of task tend to limit their contribution to the conversation, trying to give more opportunity to the examinee to speak. But doing so, the interaction is not encouraged, which can be translated into a lack of authenticity and interactiveness at the same time. So that's why the picture is not complete, it's kind of cut because it's kind of partially met. Um, however, the oral interview does not require any type of special equipment, which means that, it's, uh, that it has practicality. So the last one is fine. So this being said, authenticity and interactiveness are the main qualities needed in the current practice of examining uh, the oral proficiency. And there is need to get a type of exam that covers these features and provides real world situations where examinees can demonstrate their abilities in a more realistic way. That is why I come with my proposal that are the scenarios. So the scenarios are situations fostering strategic interaction for language learning. Its features are uh, first, the learner only knows the role um, they will play which would be the main difference with a normal role play. Second, there is an unknown dramatic tension, which is the reason of why this tool provides a realistic task, because in real life, we don't always know what the other person uh, in the communication are going to say. There, uh, it is adaptable to work on pragmatic competence in general, because you can work with speech acts, for instance, or you can create a situation evolving uh, a certain type of pragmatic knowledge, so everything can be adapted to your purpose. So therefore, a scenarios encourage interaction and communication. But how is the process of, um, or the steps to carry out an scenario? So the process of executing an scenario involves uh, several key steps. First, uh, the rehearsal phase, uh, where the participants familiarize themselves with the context of the provided situation. Uh, the objective of the communication and their own role because they do not know the role of the other one. Next, there comes the performance stage where the scenario is represented and there, there it is, like that's the moment where participants get the full picture of the situation because through the representation of the scenario is when they understand the whole situation and they realize they have a communicative goal to reach slightly different from what they may be thought. And finally, the debriefing phase uh, typically is used in classroom settings where strengths and weaknesses are openly discussed among the participants to improve uh, future performances. So as mentioned before, the scenarios can be adapted um, to meet the specific requirements of the evaluation process. In this instance, um, I use actual guidelines as a foundation for the scenario creation. So for advanced levels, for instance, a scenarios can be created with situations where past, past, present, and future tenses are needed. Regarding intermediate level scenarios, this can be created around the ability to generate language related to fa familiar daily uh, life topics. And finally, at the beginner um, level, scenarios involve communicating short messages on highly predictable everyday topics. The first example I have for a beginner scenario is this one. So as I said before, you provide the context to both or to all the people involved in the scenario because there can be more than two roles. And then they receive just the role. So in this uh, example, the context for the beginner um, level is you are with your roommate and are going to adopt a pet, convince them to adopt the one you want. So, just to have like the information about the situation that you're going to perform. So the role A, you want to adopt a cat because they are easier to take care of. I didn't have to take them to the park. Sorry, to the park. You don't like going out much. Now, what is the role B? You want to adopt a dog because they are fun and can play in the park. You love going out. So the dramatic tension in this scenario arises from the conflicting desires to have different tastes in uh, pets while needing to adapt and choose only one. This tension is heightened by the emotional attachment individuals may have to their preferred pets, as well as the necessity of compromise and decision-making 
in selecting just one pet to accommodate everyone's preferences. So that's what um, people in the SNR are going to realize once they start performing this. Moving on the intermediate level, we have this context. Uh, you are with a friend and you are playing, um, planning, sorry, planning a surprise party for a common friend. You need to buy and prepare everything in order to have an unforgettable celebration. You need to coordinate every single detail, date, time, place, guest, budget, etc., to have a successful party. So this is the context. What is the role A? You know that your best friend is a food lover. That is why you think it's better to invest in good food because this is the best memory that your best friend will keep. Therefore, you think about getting the food in an expensive restaurant that your friend loves the most. Additionally, you think it is better to have a few guests at the party because it will be comfier and you're investing already in good food. This means less people, less money. Convince your, convince your friend that this is the best plan to follow. But what is the role be? Your best friend likes parties and this is not your time, and this is your time to shine. You think it's better to buy fast food because it is easier to manage. Additionally, your idea includes a lot of yes and decorations because the more the merrier. Convince your friend that this is the best plan to follow. In this scenario um, of intermediate level, the dramatic tension stems for, from the varying opinions that influence the planning of the party. Much like the previous scenario, there is uh, participants uh, that needs to reach an agreement. So the tension arises as individuals navigate different pre preferences and priorities to ensure the success of the event while maintaining harmony uh, among the friends group. So that's something that they're going to realize during the performance. And finally, uh, the example for the advanced level scenario, we have this context. In your Spanish class, you're going to present a group project in two weeks. You have this class twice a week, Monday and Thursday, so you need to choose a date for it with your partner. Role A. You prefer to present on Monday because then you will have time to prepare for a trip you have the following weekend. If you don't present this first, you won't be able to concentrate on your other assignments and plan and plan for the trip, which is quite important to you because you're going to celebrate your anniversary with your partner. So what is the role be? You prefer to present on Thursday because you're coming back from a trip you had the previous weekend. Your trip would be with your partner to celebrate your anniversary, meaning that your mind will not be focused on studies during that weekend. Therefore, if you present first, you won't have that much time to prepare. So in this final scenario, the dramatic tension arises from the necessity of accommodating different situations within the same time frame. Similar to the previous scenarios at the beginning and the intermediate while, uh, intermediate one, there is a focus on fostering interaction among participants to reach agreements. The tension is fueled by the challenge of our conflicting needs, our priorities are within the constraints of the shared time frame, prompting individuals to engage in collaborative problem solving and negotiating to find mutual satisfactory solutions. So the same as before, this is something that the people who are representing the SNI are going to realize just until the moment that they are in the performance stage. So therefore, the scenario offers authenticity um, as it mirrors real life situations and interactiveness as the dramatic tension prompts interaction. Consequently, it serves as an alternative uh, for assessing fluency, offering a realistic evaluation method. Uh, at the beginning, I said the scenario is more used during the class, uh, classroom settings, but not exactly uh, for evaluation purposes. And that's my proposal to adapt this scenario uh, for the evaluation purposes. So all this information can be met in the words of Van Compernal. Assessment, assessments of L2 learners speaking abilities have traditionally made two broad assumptions. The first is that a speaking ability resides in the individual. The second is that speaking is an abstract, generalizable skill, which the individual can demonstrate his or her ability so that the individual speech sample can be evaluated in terms of some set of criteria that present the specific context of the assessment. So uh, this means that traditional assessments of L2 learners speaking abilities assume that speaking isn't like an innate skill and can be generalized. Thus, the aim of these assessments is to provide a context 
for individuals to demonstrate their abilities, enabling their speech samples to be evaluated based on criteria that extend beyond the assessment context. For that reason, scenarios could be a good alternative to evaluate oral performance in a target language because the scenario provides a context and interaction, giving the opportunity to the examinees to demonstrate their capacities of being situated in a simulated real life task and performing based um, on dramatic no uh, pragmatic norms of the target language. This way, speaking is not only an individual performance, but a result of a co-construction of ideas within a contextualized communicative situation. Uh, well, this, uh, like a note on the side, at least based on my own uh, experience as an L2 English speaker, being able to perform in an oral interview does not necessarily mean that you're able to communicate appropriately in your second language and that others are going to be able to understand your communicative goal because this is something that happened to me. Presenting this type of oral interviews as exams, I got great results, but once I was faced uh, to the real life uh, of talking to others, of native speakers, the exact CS was not exactly the same as I expected, so I have to kind of figure it out how it works. And I know that sometimes this type of exams that not, does not match exactly the needs of a real speaker in a second language context. So, um, additionally, using, using the scenarios, it would be possible to measure process, um, speaking rhythm, time, and this is based on the narrow perspective because, as I said before, you can just uh, use the data collected in the scenario and make a qualitative analysis of these type of uh, features in the speech sample you get from the scenario. So you're able to measure this. And on the broad perspective, um, it allows you to measure terms and interaction because, of course, that's exactly what the scenario provides you with, with the opportunity to really interact and look for that interaction with others and in the same um, in the same level. Because if you are with another person that is on the same level that you, I think it's more natural to find that type of conversation rather than having just an evaluator and you because there is like the difference of power. Um, there is as well the option to measure the pragmatic linguistic knowledge because as I showed you before, you can just add other types of pragmatic uh, features in the scenario when you create it. Uh, you can evaluate a speech act or something else that, you're, that you need to evaluate but adapt it. So this can be able to be evaluated there. You can evaluate as a way the speed and causes because it's similar to the previous one. You can make this based on perception as well. So this is kind of um, the biggest picture on how the scenario can be useful um, and used uh, in the evaluation settings. Um, it depends on the researchers, researchers if they want to evaluate the narrow or the broad perspective, but you're able to do all this with the data found and collected through the scenario. So, um, in conclusion, uh, scenarios embody uh, authenticity and interactiveness that are the qualities that I mentioned before because they are adapted to your needs and you can create them thinking about real life situations and they could be authentic and of course the interaction is always present in the interaction because that's exactly um, one of the main goals of this type of tool uh, when you need to reach a communicative goal with somebody else but you will understand that at the moment of performing not before and that's what happened in real life, you, if you're going to ask, for instance, you are in another country, you're going to use your second language or there or whatever, and you need to ask for a copy. But then you ask for a copy and then the person, instead of telling you, asking you, or answering you, yes, they can ask you, okay, what type of coffee you, you want? And they can mention a lot of type of coffee, but if you don't know what type you want and you don't know how to express that, that is where you kind of get a stock up. So that's the interaction that you can get with the scenario because there is this dramatic tension and that allows you to really, okay, what should I do in this situation? And you really need to face um, these type of situations in real life because not everything is like as planned as you think or as you want sometimes, no, not always, sometimes. 
So it as well offers the realistic simulation of conversations because of these same reasons, and you can adapt them. And uh, they can be assessed from both the broad perspective. So you can um, use evaluators to evaluate the performance on the scenario based on their perceptions. You can use the rubric or the written scale you, you want, you need, or that you can adapt it to your needs. And at the same time, you can evaluate um, the performance in the scenario based on the narrow perspective because you can measure uh, the speech rate, uh, how many poses they have, how long they are, where they are located. So you really can use all these data collected, collected in the scenario uh, and measure it in the either way, uh, broad or narrow, and apply the features uh, to be considered for a language test and uh, using a realistic simulation of conversation uh, in order to make it a versatile tool for assessing language profici proficiency. And at the same time, I think these uh, features of the scenario are related with the words you said at the beginning that you relate with uh, fluency, because that's what fluency is. You can have it in a narrow perspective or in the broad one, but that's exactly what it is. You need to consider communication, interaction, so you have to consider all these kind of things. And it's important, I think, to say that uh, the fluency skill is not just given by an individual, but by the construction of the ideas and the performance you have uh, based on an interaction and the understanding of the situation, because that, that's exactly what communication is, that you can talk to others, that they understand what you want to say, that you understand what they want to tell you, and that you can communicate appropriately based on the language you are learning and the language that you're using. So this is my idea of the scenario. Um, and that's why I said this is my proposals are my reasons uh, to suggest this as a tool to evaluate um, oral proficiency in any language because it can be adapted to any language. So thank you. Um, here is my information and the references in case that you are interested or just gonna go in deeper with these uh, previous steps. Thank you, Nelly. Um, So we also already have a few questions in the chat, but I wanted to start by um, asking a question that sort of brings your sort of more theoretical level research to mm -hmm. a practical level that's related to Carla's work. And that is, what are the classroom teaching implications of thinking about fluency in this way and thinking about scenarios as a, a measure of fluency? Have you mm -hmm. thought about like what this means for the way that we might structure classroom learning? Sure, I think that, and it's something I use in mm -hmm. some classes I had before. I use the scenarios as a tool to teach and to practice. And at the end, I use it as well to evaluate. So this is a way to follow like the communicative approach instead of just thinking about rules or just kind of in a straight way. Uh, because knowing, um, for instance, knowing the imperfect and the pretty doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to use it. So these are good ways to really um, encourage in the classroom as well, to provide these opportunities to students so they can communicate through the scenarios and they can have like a, small practices uh, so when they are really faced with situations where they need to face things like this they feel more prepared and i think that helps as well with their own confidence level of knowledge of a language uh, that was what happened to me at least uh, they felt more ready and when they went out i just say this because i was teaching in an abroad setting um, and sometimes the students were scared of going to the cafeteria to ask for a coffee because they were not sure if they were, were if they were going to be able to manage this. So often performing this in class where they are in an environment that they have the input, the scaffolding and everything they need to reach the goal, they feel more prepared so they go um, and they feel more prepared to face this type of situations in a real context. So I think it's a real tool uh, that shows like realistic situations kind of 
and that you can use in the classroom, like as normal way to promote the communicative approach. Um, and, I, and now I'm just proposing this as an evaluation method as well. Great, thanks. Um, so the first question that we have in the chat is from Mandy, and uh, she asks if you could talk a little bit about the third criterion, practicality, and how these compare to other formats that have been used for assessment. These meaning the scenarios, I think, yeah. A scenario, okay. So yeah. I think in this case, uh, it is related with the way that you create the scenarios. So you need to create situations, as I said before, that are realistic. So if you're planning to create um, like role plays or any other activity, which involves more um, equipment or developing of things, it's gonna be harder for participants to perform. And the practicality means like how easy can they manage this, like the examinees to perform, and at the same time for the evaluator. Uh, I know that in this case for the scenarios, um, uh, it's a student research, uh, that's why it's student research. Uh, you're just kind of deciding like how to measure this type of, measure this type of stuff, uh, based on this data that you can collect on the scenarios. Uh, but, um, I'm just trying to think the words <laughs> of, of what I'm thinking. Um, you can, uh, create context, what is a way kind of easy to follow. Uh, for the evaluator that can understand what they're going to do. And for the ones who are performing the scenario so they can make it like in a realistic way, maybe. Uh, I think that's the, maybe the word I want to use. Um, so it's not that hard to evaluate because if you are measuring fluency, uh, that's exactly what you need to provide this to the examinees of the opportunity to show that they have this skill so it's kind of related with what they do and what you evaluate, and that's and there is like that relation. I'm not sure if I answered that question. Yeah, I would also think like for practicality, time would also be a factor, right? Like how much time does it take to implement scenarios as an assessment tool, right? Um, that can impact practicality of an assessment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah. So it can be uh, as well like different it can be a little bit different if you are using it in a classroom setting because of course you have like to adapt it in accordance with your objective of the class with uh, the topics the tenses but for like a wider perspective like thinking about the proficiency exams uh you will need to find like a situation that is more standard uh but at the same time that it agrees like has, it has an agreement with the actual guidelines for instance uh because it depends on the type of level that you want you want to evaluate. So it should be necessary to create the standard, um, like to standardize this a little bit more in a way that it can be used in any context with any students, but as long as they correlate with the level they want to uh, show they, they have. So the Mandy has a second question that's a little bit related, um, and Adolfo has asked a follow-up to Mandy's question. So I'm going to read them both. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, how do you anticipate fluency might vary across more traditional assessments, like descriptive tasks, retellings, and interviews versus scenarios? And then the follow-up is, um, <clears throat> how might it vary related to different types of contexts? Um, or how um, student familiarity with the task might affect importance or how cognitive load might affect performance on a scenario task. Well, <laughs> a, lot, a lot there. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. There are a lot of questions in those two. <laughs> I mean, feel free to just think about the first part, which is, you know, how would fluency vary across between more traditional assessments versus scenarios? Okay, so as this is like a proposal, I don't know exactly what was, where the difference is gonna be. However, I think that people who are really fluent and who really got this oral proficiency of a level, they will be able to face this type of task because that's, that's exactly what you're looking for in a proficiency 
level certified, but you're able to communicate in a certain level. So if you really have the level, you're expected to really communicate appropriately with another person in a different context. So you should have tools to manage this type of conversations. I know it's a little bit more challenging than the ones that we have right now, because you're used to do that, to face to an evaluator, and that person can ask you, okay, tell me more about your day, um, what you like to do the most, like something like that is more familiar to you. So it's kind of your comfort zone. But with a, a scenario, it's a way to challenge yourself as well, to be realistic about how able you are uh, to use the target language in a real context. And as I said before, that's like a personal experience as well, because when I perform these um, interviews, these oral interviews as exams, the performance was great. Oh my God, I have a good score and grading criteria and everything. But when I when it was the time to really face real communication with native speakers of my target language, which is English, um, I face uh, difficulties somehow to, okay, I'm not sure how to say this, or I don't know how to communicate this in a good way because there are different norms, uh, like pragmatic features that are different. But that's exactly the point of showing the proficiency in a level that you have certain knowledge of this. And because not you, you cannot use your own norms uh, in your language, in other language, because that can be different. So that's the point of learning a language that is like kind of a complete um, tool because you can think about it as an intercultural tool, like to promote that too, because you need to understand the camp differences. So that's why it promotes the pragmatic knowledge. Um, and I think it's different in the sense that uh, if you're like, it's more challenging. If you're really able to show that you have the level, you're going to be able to perform um, successfully in this type of task. But if you're not, I think you need to um, get a better picture of the language you're learning to understand more those pragmatic norms and to be able to uh, talk to other, others. Uh, of course, it's going to be fine to have somebody else to talk to and that you're able to say, oh, can you just reframe this? I didn't understand this. Like, that's completely fine. Like, the scenario is not made for you to understand absolutely everything without even asking for repetition. But it's, that's exactly the way uh, that you show uh, your competence in the language that you're able to manage that type of things because that can happen in your own language too. Like, you don't understand what somebody said. So that you're able to manage that type of things too. That you can ask, can you repeat this? Or can you clarify this? Or did you mean this? Like, things like that. So that's part of the um, essence of the scenario that you can, that you're able to manage all these type of things, which is as well the goal when you learn and when you teach a language. Yeah, and I think your response is related to Adolfo's follow-up question, particularly about cognitive load. That is the scenarios that you presented were quite long, right? And they had a degree of complexity to them. And so, what is the impact of sort of student processing time, cognitive load on their ability to manage mm -hmm. um, scenarios, right? And you, sp you spoke to that partially, but I don't know if you have additional thoughts about that. Yeah, well, as, as I said before, the first part of the, uh, the, 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 the phase where they learn about their context and their role, so they don't know the other role, but they need to understand their role and the context. So this is a time given uh, to examinees to read the situation, understand the role. So there will be a time given to all of them to like kind of be aware of the situation and understand that because it's not that you give them the role and then read it, okay, now it's there. No, you give them a time and they have a time to process this information and to kind of, okay, let me think about it. And then after a little bit of time, okay, now it's time to perform. So I think it's a way as well to help them uh, and don't throw them uh, just without any uh, preparation or something. It's not something, it doesn't mean that they have all the time they want to prepare because that's not the point, because the point of the real communication that you're spontaneous somehow with the things that you won't communicate. So you just give them a time to prepare uh, to make them feel more comfortable with the situation and with their own role. And that way they will be able 
to perform it. Um, and as I said before, it is more challenging than the oral interview, but that's exactly how real life works. Um, you're not expecting to go somewhere else and know what everybody's going to respond to your questions or something. You need to, okay, keep an eye on that and just kind of being more realistic uh, on what they're going to find outside of the evaluation. So we have one last question. It's it's also a little bit related to some of the responses that you've already given. And this is from Darlene, and I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit. Um, so when you're giving a, an assessment that is designed to um, focus on students' fluency in the language, mm -hmm. um, what are the implications for accuracy, but also complexity? Are, is there a trade-off if you're if you're designing these assessments to be really focused on eliciting fluency from your students? Is is there then is our fluency or our accuracy and complexity sacrificed? Um, you had spoken a little bit to this about students saying they don't really always have the vocabulary or the structures to be able to complete the task. Well, I think that it depends on the purpose you have with this. So what I have done with this is that. I do not penalize them for this um, lack of accuracy or things like that, because that's something I live to. I saw people who were using their second language with a pretty low level of accuracy, but they really could communicate well what they wanted. And native speakers of that language understood what they wanted to say, and they could have a conversation and, do under and they understood like what they wanted to say. And on the other um, hand, I saw people with a huge level of accuracy, but they didn't know so well how to say things, or they didn't have like the proper um, features of their in their speech. So native speakers could not under understand them uh, the same way as they did with the others, even if there was a lack of accuracy. So it depends on what you want to get and on the purpose of this. Uh, and I think that it is expected anyway, certain level of accuracy, because that's related with the actual uh, guidelines. So, of course, you expected an advanced level to manage um, present, past, and that type of things. So, of course, that's related with it. And that's what you would do with a more deep analysis, like in the narrow perspective, where you want to have a perception, but more deep. Uh, and not just like the overall picture. Because usually the overall picture is the one that kind of misses this type of things. Because you are thinking about, oh yes, he's speaking with a good smooth, he's like kind of fast, doesn't have so many pauses. And sometimes the lack of accuracy does not really impact what you want to say. So when you have both evaluations, like the broad one and the Narrow one is in the narrow one when you make more focus on this type of things, because those are the ones that need to be in agreement uh, with the level that you are evaluating. So yeah, it depends on uh, the type of um, data or research you want to do. Great, well, thank you so much, Letty, for sharing your research and for uh, managing some challenging questions about <laughs> research. And we wanna thank everybody for attending today and for asking such thoughtful questions. Um, we hope that we'll see you at the final Carla talk in April and have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Daddy.